Hello, hello, hello. Hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> well, thank you very much for making the effort to come here. I know some people drove here from a larger distance than others, and I really appreciate that. And uh, let's see. Well, I am Andy's daughter, Bessie, otherwise known as Elizabeth. And my brother Peter is currently in the kitchen there making a lot of noise. <laughs> okay. Um, I've asked all the speakers to give a little summary of how they first met Andy and how they became a fan of his poetry. And I'll start with myself. And so I bought it, I met Andy the day I was born. I don't remember. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't remember our first meeting in great detail, but it was at Jefferson Hospital because I was born here in Birmingham. Um, when I first became a fan, that had to be 1963, I was 12. The third token was the name of a booklet that was published by a woman who was down here in Birmingham named Adele Robinson. And I looked through it when Andy gave, he came home and gave me a copy. I guess it had arrived in the mail. And I looked through it and I said, ah, there's a poem called To Betsy. And I was immediately a fan. <laughs> um, what's it been like having a poet for a father, or specifically Andy as a father? Well, he worked at a nine to five job all of his life until retirement. And the fact that he's been so prolific is due to the fact that he'd get up early in the morning to write, he'd come home at lunch and write, he'd spend a portion of each evening writing, and often spend part of his weekends writing. And this is why he's produced such a large volume of work, despite having a nine to five job. Oh, hi, Jeannie. I didn't see you. Um, for those of you who don't know, I am the editor for this book. Why did I become the editor for the book? Well, there was a demand for the book because of him being the poet laureate and because of the induction into the Alabama Writers Hall of Fame. And a few years ago, Andy told me he'd already put together a prospective manuscript for a proposed book with suggested poems and a title. And in, he actually even at that time told me he still had enough poems left for at least one other book beyond that, and this is probably true. So basically, I was the only one with the patience to work around his creative tendency to save his poems into completely unrelated folders on his computer. <laughs> and I could actually find the files that were disappeared. And the, the fact that he continued to revise the poems that he'd even originally suggested for that manuscript meant that there were multiple versions in various folders, so I had to then find the latest versions as they had evolved, because as a poet, for all of my life, certainly, I've always known that he will write a poem, he'll begin it, He'll put it in a drawer, and it may be six months, it may be several years, but he'll take it back out again and start working on it again, and that's always been his method for writing. The most challenging moment as the child of Andrew Glaze. That had to be 1966, when I was a high school sophomore, and his first book was published. Anybody remember the title of his first book? Damned Ugly Children. So Peter and I had that to live down, but I was the one in high school. And of course, we knew that the poem, the title poem, was referring to a love-hate relationship with his poems. However, Andy had so many people ask if his children were really ugly that he asked Peter and I to provide wallet photos. That way they could decide for themselves. All right, so Peter, you want to come on up? Peter's going to introduce himself and then read a poem. Well, as Betsy said, I am Peter Glaze, and I'm actually eight years younger than Betsy. Although I was born in New York City, and he had already moved up north by then. And uh, but aside from that, my meeting Andy experience was remarkably similar to Betsy's. <laughs> 
So I'm not going to go too in-depth into any of that. Um, I am going to read a poem entitled, entitled Garcia's Story. Garcia, the storekeeper, blow my window every day at the curb, sweeping before the sun gets up, patiently gathers bottles, the broken shiver stars of yesterday's do-nothings, who sleep as ever across the hoods of parked cars. His wife, getting up late with gummy eyes, stands in the doorway, trading the time of day with customers, children, loafers, and dogs. Garcia's indolent son, a sort of tire man of waste fat, will squat upon his black motorbike. It's his third this year. His Fu Manchu mustache and unshaved, dirty cheeks will squeeze out from under the helmet, shading a cloud of greasy black hair. Every day, Garcia watches it all serenely. His hollow cheeks are withered. He sells coconut bars and chicken wings, peers through his dirty glasses across sales slip figures with his naked gums and two teeth. Twice a year, they've come in under the floor and skipped away with a dozen cases of his beard. He shrugs, sniffs, and nails up a network of two-by-fours. At nine in the night, he stands by the adding machine, figuring the day, talking to Anselmo, the numbers runner, who leans over his cane, rubbing his white fuzz of hair. Garcia fumbles the numbers into the machine, takes out the paper, peers at it under his glasses, licks his lips, says okay, shakes his head with a sort of benediction. Then he puts on his red woodsman's jacket, slams the gate, and sets the burglar alarm. Never does it go off with the moonlight celebration of a burglar. It rings by itself many a night at 4 a.m. <laughs> Garcia will patiently rise up out of his bed and float like a wraith around the corner to set it again. And when he leaves, he will hesitate, then pat his door gently, like quieting a restless, sleepless child. Now, in New York City, after Andy moved up there where we lived, Garcia's was the store down below my window every day. So I heard all of these things, but Andy saw them and took note. Anyway, Betsy has some more. <laughs> Yeah, I forgot to tell the readers. But... Yeah. I actually have a binder up here with the poems if you need to, to read it from up here. So Barry Marks is next. He's reading Fisherman. I'm going to begin with the poem. <clears throat> Fisherman. How curling the banks the swirling rivers, the thump of the creel. The fishermen seek a logical colloquy of wildlife and loaves with shining words. Then once in a while they watch their talismans over brutishness and power go down, blighted by the savagery of fact. As the civil world, civil world presses agreeably on in its ramping, murderous way, they come to be swept off like us all, and forced to mouth the blameless blame. Swearing to lies, they'll be wasted in the squalor. But after the cycles have inched about another click with luck, they'll cautiously hoist themselves from out of the caves of hiding and once more casting to catch the shining words, hang them like silver mornings in the sun. I first met Andy, didn't first meet Andy, until uh, his inauguration as poet laureate. But I knew who he was. I've been reading his poems for many years and was struck by the fact that they are intelligent but never dry. Never so complicated that with some work and digging, you're not going to be rewarded. They're beautiful but never sentimental. And they're wry, witty, and often downright funny, but never trivial. 
In other words, he does everything I've been trying to do for 50 years, but a damn sight better. <laughs> um, I'm honored to be here, honored to be able to share today, and to have read one of Andy's poems. And all I can say is thank you, Andy, for all of these poems, all these books. And uh, hope to be here for the next one. <laughs> Love. Sometime along the way, though love poems may flap and squawk, then escape, the long years with luck, the ghost of one somehow may come skittering back. Liquid as mist, its phantom will rise. The stinks you've remembered as bitter will be dried and perfumed like wild grass. Long forgotten names and places will ache to come spilling out. And, ho the, and the hosts of oblivion once more will speak. Old songs will mutter themselves into life, remembering dreams and when that time a right wakens, you, you'll come to swear to yourself that something has shifted weight at the Earth's center. While the harmony lasts, what you dream you will seem to touch. What evanesces will seem to endure forever. Though it takes life for only a moment or so, as it awakes from its wraithy home, you'll once more shudder and sing, and out of its ghostly enchanted world, remember the miracle of speech. read a, uh, a note from one of Andy's old friends, a uh, gentleman by the name of Anthony Rudolph. He was a, uh, is a London-based poet and publisher, and in 1964 he published a booklet of Andy's poems entitled The Mask of Surgery, Poems and Translations. I just want to preface this by saying when Andy uh, was in New York when I was a child, he was working for the British Tourist Authority. BTA, and uh, I remember Tony, and Tony was an Englishman. And I realized last night as I was going over Tony's note that it was gonna be almost impossible for me to read this without falling into an English accent. <laughs> so I apologize if that's any pretension, if that seems pretentious in any way, but it's just gonna happen, so I'm not even gonna fight it. <laughs> Dearest Andy, greetings from your old friend. We first met in New York as fellow employees of the British Travel Association back in our mid-60s, before I took up a post at the Chicago office. Our early conversations led me to realize that you, about 20 years older than me, and author of a wonderful first book of poems, Damned Ugly Children, were an ideal interlocutor, and I surely sensed that on some level you could and would be helpful to a novice or wannabe poet. In return, I don't think there was anyone else at BTA who had the slightest interest in poetry, so there was something in our dialogue for you, too. You were to become my first mentor. I had written a number of what I hoped were poems. I wanted to share my presumed deep feelings and interesting thoughts with readers, but such feelings and thoughts do not make a poem unless there is close attention to language, to sound, to music, to what we call the noise of poetry. I had been fooling myself, and on some level I knew it, but Andy would ride to my rescue. Yes, Andy had the answers to a poetry maiden's prayer. I wanted praise, but I also wanted the truth. Stealing myself, I sent you a bunch of poems. You replied with a letter which I still possess. It is a masterpiece of affectionate tact. <laughs> Somehow you found one or two things to praise, but you went on to explain frankly and lucidly why most of what I wrote did not work or play as poetry. And you ended with a valuable piece of advice. Begin a poem as near to the end as you can. 
Much love to you, dear friend, poet, and mentor, and thank you for your gift, which changed my life. A love, to, a love too to dear Adrienne, who loves you as you love her, a marriage of, of true minds. And signed Tony, London, England, July 2015. Now I'm going to read a poem called A Spell Coming On. When the spell came on, he'd gather about him four or five accustomed to this journey, content to sit spellbound, a couple hour or two in thrall, and he'd begin to speak like warming an instrument. The subject, what came to him this particular moment, a divertisement about Japanese bathhouse customs, the history of weather, how to construct a university out of sticks and stones, being a biochemical race mixer in the belly button of the South. It was always a trip, like dashing and wandering through hill country on a company bus, wanging and sheeting water between vegetable rows, flying, snapping tree branches with bundles of interruptions dropping like events in the middle of happenings, or parcels of accidental newspapers from posterity delivered along imaginary routes. With a stop for breath, He'd plunge on through towns and slums across the lanes, where sunlight and shadow snapped and blared, and eventful fact and fruitful wish crashed on top of one another like waves or ragweed and kale tumbled in the harvest. Someone, incredulous hearing for the first time this obligato of words and pictures, accused him of being a poet. <laughs> Laughing, eyes somber, Bobby shook his head. You mistake the nature of poetry. I'm more a tra traveling agriculturist, setting out our plants as I go, hoping a few will be lucky enough to root and catch above the whoosh of the tires and the whisk of the water. Sometime, with luck, I hope, though the highway of, through the highway of clatter, because I'm filled with delight, it will make a kind of music. I'm only witness to the song. And that, of course, is dedicated to Bobby. Okay, so the next readers are um, Jim Reed, and following him is Liz Reed, and they're going to do a kind of a joint thing together, I believe. <laughs> I just sold a first edition dust jacketed copy of Dan Dunkley Children in the Bookshop this last week. I'm always out going through estates trying to find copies of that book, and I've gotten lucky a lot of times. So we recycle it. Back to the readers, back to the readers. <laughs> and now, after all these years, I'm a damned ugly poet. <laughs> Trees, in memory of Adele Robinson. It was a strange wood in which she decided to consider herself lost. It was filled with sun at cool angles. Sylvanum densiflora bracken, live trees with lulling voices. Trunks of bodies starting from the earth like plants. Screams without throats. Lianas tangled in unnameable wildness. A world which would not accept order. Existence snuffled with warty nozzle about this stranger unacquainted with mere fact, but who did not evade its vilest bubblings and quakings. She would not draw back from the black crevasses which allowed her to name it a name. Imagine it to a shape it had not become, except as a neighbor to fear. She recollected a prophet who spoke from a tree. At first, doubtfully, then gratefully, at last, brimming with courage, became what was determined to take her, and turning it inside out, grew herself into death and gave it her soul. Thank you. And just to show you, 
how he gets better and better and better and it was always good from the beginning. It's hard to believe those two contradictory things. This is a 1970 copy of Folio magazine in Birmingham, uh, edited by Myra Crawford uh, after Adele left. And Myra still runs the Hackney Literary Awards all these years later. Uh, I'm gonna read you one poem which I just find delightful that you need to see this side of Andy, okay? Flying. Sucked into the cyclone, I am lifted five miles over Kansas, flying in a farmhouse. Oh, look at all the checkerboards everywhere. Winter wheat looks like velvet from 20,000 feet. Soon we will be coming down in Oz, and I have for years been carrying green spectacles in my waistcoat pocket against this very day. But for the moment, there is this whirly gig, this terrible vertigo, the planks banging, the shutters flying, and the bats banging against the bed, fear, fury, a sense of dust in the mouth and ice in the chest, just before all is silent and the gardens are full of hiding dwarves. Somewhere, the witch has become dead. Her feet are melting like icicles, melting, melting about the heart. Soon the singing will start rolling in from everywhere. All the flowers will turn into trumpets and yellow brick signposts. Take out the glasses, open them, pick a yellow rose from my coat and, oh, Emerald City. <laughs> sort of bird. Instead, they scream, harpies screeching across the reef. The shallow harbor foams a motley green, and rising from its snaky arbor, a tunic of dark wood crawls up the island breast, escaping into tropical dreams, building from driftwoods its palaces of kingdom come. Above, a lowering purple mountain rides, goddess of desire, pressing a lazy haunch against the luxuriant sky. A puttering launch, a pilot yawning, thumps the indifferent tide. Where pirates anchored, throngs of beach boys ride. Today we lunch at the inn, Upon a veranda spread three sides, then spend afternoon climbing the spur of a hill to watch how the sunset drops with a thump and night falls down like a violent thief. Then the dark is stung with a hive of hissing kerosene lamps, and amid them we seek our temporary home down from the jungle on rented double wheels down those rutted roads, slowly feeling the way, till we come to the clearer asphalt and let the petals fly. Of a sudden, children playing by the road begin to follow where we go. A running, screaming, Creole crowd to see two grown-up elderly kids go flying past in the dark. They ran, we fled in the name of terror. They tried to catch us in the name of fun, till we came to the edge of what they called the town, and they suddenly stopped like a songless choir blown up out of blackness, lighting its watchful but indifferent train of fire. I was trying to remember when I first met Andy, and it had something to do with the Birmingham Arts Journal. And we met again at a Christmas party at their house. What was interesting to me about being assigned to this poem is that I have been to Barbados twice, and my experience is not dissimilar from yours. It's a hauntingly beautiful place. If I had the gift that you have, I would have written about it too. Thank you.
And in fact, the poem that was titled to Betsy that was originally in the third token was had also revisions after that and then appeared in a later book of a full-blown book that he had published as well. Um, okay, Tad? Sunday afternoon, I went home and I thought something strange is happening. And I, I pulled off a copy of Robert Frost's poetry and started reading the poems. And then I thought, I, I have heard these poems before, just this afternoon. And what is it that I'm hearing? Uh, for several years, I taught uh, 19th century American writers from Emily Dickinson, Thoreau, Emerson, even Henry James, Hawthorne, and so on. So you couldn't miss, I couldn't have missed the word transcendentalism, you see. And uh, very briefly, uh, I tell the students, I can't tell you what a transcendentalist is, and I can't tell you what a transcendentalist experience is unless you have one. Then you will know. <laughs> well, talking with Andy over 40 years of correspondence and uh, editing some of his books and so on, um, I frequently would have that thought uh, that I'm hearing something in his poetry and I saw I stopped right in the middle. You know, what is it that I hear? It is poetry. It isn't something else. It isn't a transcendental vision and so on. It is Andy as a poet making poetry. So that in all our uh, teachings and research over the past year, 70 years, and in America, when we talk about different styles of writing and different approaches with criticism, there is still something missing there from Andy's writing, and it's all the paraphernalia that goes with the critical material that has come out of the universities primarily. So, it isn't that Andy says, I'm not a university person, because he went to Harvard, 
and he went to Stanford, and he has had an education that was well worth it. But I was telling Bob, Bobby this afternoon that the quality of Andy's poetry is the quality of intelligence that grasps language, and it takes hold of it, and then it takes hold of us when we read it. So I celebrate today Andy's poetry. If you can write a poem that is poetry, you needn't worry about anything else. Because, and this is what critics look for sometimes without knowing it. They're searching for something that says, this is a poem. But I won't ask you anymore what kind of poetry Andy writes. Just read it. <laughs> and so, okay, so here is Days of Being Born. <clears throat> that substantiates something I've been saying about Andy's writing. And that is, you can have a poem in language that's not ordinary language. And yet it, too, it is also ordinary language because it touches us, it gets to us. Well, here is Days of Being Born. The first day of being born is sun falling out over garden, ash, and tree, bidding farewell to snowdrift, hiring representations out of wind, out of the wind. Advancing into the world with no expectation, its first walk is random, unglittering, not well advised. And next, it learns spinning, like a Catherine wheel. I'll come back to that. It calculates tricks and subtly spills out its pockets of scattered shots, loans. Its earliest welcome comes streaming, beginning with only a whisper. Already, it's risen to a well-sprung humming. And then all at once, as though learning to brood, it awakens, loosed in the enormous nesting sky. It rustles a tall order of birds and wings. Yeah. So, the, the Catherine wheel it refers to Catherine of Alexandria about 307 A.D., who was tortured on a wheel. I'm going to read a letter from uh, Linda Allard, who has been a longtime friend of Andy's. He said, uh, Linda Allard is a poet, writer, and editor. She is currently an assistant professor of English at the University of Rochester. I first met Andy at the Bread Loaf Writers Conference in 1948. He was a Bread Loaf Fellow and was giving a reading in the theater. I got up the courage to go up and talk with him afterward. Then he went to the grand piano and began to play. If he was trying to impress me, he succeeded. But it wasn't until 20 years later that we both had poems in the same journal that we got in touch again and began our long correspondence. We seldom met, but I remember bringing him to the University of Rochester for a reading. We had a blizzard that night, but 50 people managed to get there to hear him. What a gift it has been exchanging poems, manuscripts, books, over half a lifetime. He's irrepressible, Linda Allard. Peter? I'm going to read a, uh, a letter or 
note sent by uh, William Duretsky, who is a, uh, a poet, writer, and editor, and a professor at King College in New Hampshire. And he's also taught at Emerson, Goddard, Princeton, and Dartmouth. And he was also a, uh, a resource who was tremendously helpful to Betsy in putting together this book. I first met Andy Glaze at Middlebury College's annual Red Loaf Writers Conference in August 1969. He was, as I recall, doing mock obeisance before poet John Chardy's new white Cadillac. <laughs> he was easily the wittiest and least reverent of the writers there, and his poetry captivated me with its wit, crisp imagery, and aggressive free verse rhymes. Free, I'm sorry, aggressive free verse rhymes. Let me try that one more time. I apologize. <laughs> aggressive free verse rhythms. Ah. Thank you. I saw rhymes and I heard Andy, I thought of Andy and I said, wait a minute, that's totally wrong. <laughs> when he published Fantasy Street in The New Yorker, I knew he'd become one of the most original and compelling poets out there. Later, when Stephen Ford Brown asked me to edit a book on Andy for his series, I jumped at the chance. That collection, Earth That Sings, still seems to me a useful introduction to his work. On a more personal note, I recall an evening in late December 1985 in Andy's New York apartment, spent drinking a limited edition bourbon that Don Keck Dupre had brought up from Sewanee on the occasion of a modern language convention. That evening, with its wonderful talk and smooth whiskey, remains for me a prime example of civilization at its best. <laughs> Since then, Andy has written and published a lifetime of fine poetry. Everything in his life and work is a cut above the ordinary, the product of an extraordinary mind. And signed, Bill Dureski. I'm going to read a poem entitled Mr. Frost. It's subtitled An Undocumented Biographical Note. Mr. Frost, like most champions of the prize, was a large person, towering over the minuscule poets skittering about the local minstrelsy. One day, a gaggle of them worked out a magisterial moment for him to meet an ancient rebel confederate, it was said, alive on this earth a hundred and seven years. They wished to scrabble up the usual TV detritus about a New England bard discussing the unlikely that there was still extant, an extant rebel miner out in the dumps and pea patches at the Appalachian Crags. But when they got there, they found it was on, only an old black man of 107 years who lived in a wooden piano box on half an acre of ravine covered in pine slash out Jasper Way. He raised a dozen chickens, had a hacking cough, and the two of them got to talking what it meant to be old. You've got to keep moving, said Mr. Frost. Else your bones will freeze, agreed the old man. How do you eat, said Mr. Frost. Oh, that ain't hard, the centenarian replied. I use my welfare to buy me chicken feed, and I has an egg for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for my lungs. They awfully full of itchy dust from the mines. It seems like nothing but whiskey will cut the dust. Mr. Frost ruminated a moment, then held up his hand as if someone had started to speak. The principle is, he said, that I think we should leave this gentleman alone. He's got his life pretty well licked into shape. And as a pledge of concern and farewell, I'll buy him a bottle of whiskey, said Mr. Frost. I don't remember exactly how and when I first met Andy, but I never forget how blessed I was to meet him early in my years at UAB and to have had the privilege of knowing him and teaching his poetry for almost 40 years. I probably taught the poem 
the trash dragon of Shensi, and dozens of courses to hundreds of students. It's my favorite poem. I've heard him read many times. Pardon? Oh. I said good choice. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard him read many times, and and uh, um, there's and I've uh, worked with him at literary festivals and uh, in classroom and. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that he's an extremely interesting and gifted poet. But just as importantly, he's not only a wonderful poet, he's a very special and wonderful person. In all my encounters with Andy over 40 years, he's always been extraordinarily generous, humble, helpful, and kind. He's truly a gentle gentleman. Now, there is not so much that's gentle about his poems, however. <laughs> His poems leap and fly and dance and somersault and ricochet through real and symbolic spaces. In his poems, Glaze is a high-speed Charlie Chaplin with his dander and his dukes up. He's a fighting animal, always down at the back fence gathering handfuls of ass manure that he is able to throw 300 yards and strike his enemy, enemy in the eye without fail or he's a tragic comic dragon with a little steam nickering about his nozzle, an iconoclast and rebel, beautifully free of conventional pieties, who has never allowed a sacred cow to snip a mouthful of grass in his pasture. <laughs> a number of years ago, Andy and I had a conversation about the fact that so few old poets write about aging or about writing poems in their old age. Not long after that conversation, Andy mailed me an early version of his poem titled, Old Poet. Perhaps because I may be the oldest reader here today, besides Andy, <laughs> it's my luck and my privilege to read you Andy's revised and perfected poem titled, Old Poet. Old Poet. Clouds don't come at him anymore, seething inside with green fire, nor does the skin of lovers often proclaim like a trumpet fearful surprises. And where are the river roads that once he attended, the quarrels that whistled around him like bullets, the steaming tracks that swept him along come midnight with the gift of a single mountain lantern? Wherefrom are the words that used to hurt that hurt now twice as often? And where are the friends he loved enough to wish he might give them a bit of his time on earth? Also, old man, why can't left encounter right anymore for a battle? And where are the rattling snare drums of daylight? Why do there not canter up these days poems that stamp the hoof and offer the bridle so he must clamber topside the saddle and set himself to thunder off, not caring to guess where the gallop goes, or by what fork of the road, or by what fork of the road. to read a letter from a friend of Andy and Adriana's named Nola Perez. Nola Perez is a poet currently living on the east coast of Florida. My husband, Andre Perez, was attached to the American Embassy in Paris, France for his FAA mission. We lived in Paris for four years. When we returned to the US, it was to Miami, where Andre had responsibility for South, Central America, and the Caribbean. I experienced severe reverse culture shock, since in no way did I want to leave Paris, place of my heart. I actually went into therapy, but the person who helped the most with my transition was none other than Andy Glaze. A mutual friend of ours in New York wrote me about Andy and told me to contact him. I did, and Andy and Adriana took us into their lives. I began to feel at home in Miami. At one point, I asked Andy to work with me on my poetry and become my teacher. Andy said, 
let me think about it because I don't want to do it because I like you. I want to do it because I want to. Later, he said, it's okay. Thereafter, we met in his home once a week, sitting together at a little table. I learned more from him than any other mentor I had worked with, and I have worked with many fine poets. I keep a letter he wrote in which he critiqued a poem to highlight an important problem in my writing. Recently, I shared a portion of Andy's letter, dated April 24, 1996, with a newly organized poetry group here on Amelia Island. His intuitive comments are ones that have most influenced and improved my writing. I wanted to talk to you about the poems you sent me a bit ago. You have such a verbal felicity and such an excellent metaphoric sense. Your basic problem is that the rush and words and enthusiasm frequently bury the structure and simplicity at the heart of your poem. The rock center is there, but I think you are so fond of words and figures that you disable yourself from cutting them properly. A poet has to be two people. First, the Dionysian enthusiast who creates the poem in a rush and moment of emotion. And second, the hard-hearted, absolutely ruthless technician who strips it down to what the poem eventually says, no matter how much heartache it takes to say farewell to words you love. You must find the least you can get away with and still maintain the poem, saving the best words and metaphors and discarding the rest, dispensing with explanations and directions. The poem must say these things with metaphor rather than with explanation. I hope you won't hate me. Well, I didn't hate him. I took his counsel to heart and I became a better poet. Nola Perez. This is a poem called Sunset Rock. Subtitle is Said Billy Rose to Sally Rand. <laughs> Father Son is just settled down in a red haze up the farthest slope of the Ramapose, when suddenly, out from the dusk, with a rushing and a tinkling, we're assailed by spectral shadows. They swirl our way down through the sun careening, fire dazzled woods. They're the showgirls, draped in Jean Harlow dresses, scissored down to the buttock nape. They shriek tinnily on high double heels. Giggling and slipping on shiny Philippine grass, they spill their bathtub gin and stand for a moment, lifting their glasses to toast the sun's wild footlights off to the west. They've tittered like ghosts down from Billy Rose's house on the rise behind, with its English windows and gray slate roof, its paneled jazz age rooms. By the old liquor closet at the unused central flue, you can almost hear the Volstead Dicks come ghosting up the drive with a wail from Wampus Pond and Armonk down below. They've come with a great scattering and screeching and to-do, draining the bathtubs, the ghostly vermouth and juniper juice, pouring it out among the actual, actual roots of the memory trees, where they soar skyward like the joyous dream of a lark. None of them glows in the effulgent sunset or lays out what blazing road goes by, opens a ghostly door, or fades the light down silent driveways, driveways of the imagination. They are frolicking, a thing and a place where we can never be or go. Salute their voyage. We haven't really talked about it today, but uh, since we're focusing on Andy's poetry, but Andy is also a playwright. And uh, we have a nice, very nice note here from Arlen Dean Snyder, who's a, who's a Broadway and film and TV actor who uh, has worked with Andy and has also uh, directed one particular play of Andy's uh, a couple of times. So let me just read this. I met Andy 50 years ago when we were doing a three-person, one-act play, he wrote, called Miss Pete at the American Place Theater in Manhattan. 
Unfortunately, the original director who was assigned to it had to withdraw due to, due to a conflict, and the director he recommended to replace him was a disaster. Mm. So Andy withdrew the play after two initial preview performances. But I have been in love with the play ever since, as much as I have been in love with Andrew Glaze. In fact, I have reduced the play twice myself in small productions since that time, one at the Players Club in Manhattan, and one at the Lincoln Center Theater. Or I'm sorry, the Lincoln Center Library. In the process of the original production of the play, Andy gave all of the cast members a copy of his book, Damned Ugly Children. It had just come out and been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. I was always fascinated by the fact that whereas most people look for beauty in trees and birds and nature, Andy could walk down a Greenwich Village street in New York City and find the same beauty. So that's how I met Andrew Blaze. And if you haven't met him before, you will soon meet Andrew Blaze in his poem and his book, Overheard in a Drugstore. In a drugstore. Lucky you, signed Arlen Dean Snyder. Now, Arlen was nice enough to attempt to record a video of himself reading the poem overheard in a drugstore. And unfortunately, the audio quality on his video just was so poor that we really can't, we're not even going to try to show it. We, we originally had planned to, and in the program it says that we would, but so we're going to skip over that, I'm afraid. <coughs> I'm going to read another note from Peter Schmidt, who is a professor of creative writing at the University of Miami and the author of five collections of poems. I first met the feisty but marvelously gentle and modest man called Andy Glaze at Books and Books, the hub of Miami's arts community, in about 1990. Andy had just moved to Miami from New York after his wife inherited a house there. Although nearly 40 years separated us, we shared a friendship in poetry. Andy became like a favorite uncle I never had, especially after my father's passing in 1996. I have been proud and grateful to consider Andrew Glaze my friend. Eventually, he and his wife, Adriana, moved back to Birmingham, thus completing a circle. Miami's literary scene and my own daily life are poorer without him. Birmingham and Alabama, he once wrote, to me are unfinished and unfinishable poems. One hopes that Andy Glaze's poems are never finished. It's I'm Peter Schmidt. Andy, I'm so glad to be here. I'm so grateful to be included in this celebration of you and your life and your words, and um, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here. Um, I remember being at Jim Reed's bookstore, and Jim put in my hand, Stamp Ugly Children, and I had never seen the book before, and so I sat there, or I stood there in his store and was reading the poems and was completely enchanted, and Jim said, well, you know he lives in Birmingham, and I was like, no, you can't live in Birmingham. So, uh, and so that's how I found it. It's probably been about 10 years since that happened. And so um, I immediately got in touch with you. And I remember um, that was by email and you quickly said, um, call me on the phone. And so um, we talked on the phone some, I was a young, striving poet. And um, I remember you were so generous with your time with me and you invited me to come. And while Adriana was at a dance rehearsal and several times I visited, and, we talked poetry, and there was something magical about y'all's house. I've always loved being at your house, and um, and it was just um, it really fed me in a way that is hard to describe. You know that these friendships and this mentorship that you gave me was really really special, and um, I continue to be grateful for it. And at one point, I said, um, "I've got this book, and I've written a poem that's for you." And um, Andy said, does it have a poodle in it? <laughs> because, because 
the poodle. And um, I said, not yet, but uh, it does now. <laughs> and I remember after um, I, um, Andy read the book, he was so kind to read my manuscript before it was published. And that my favorite comment that you made, Andy, and I still, have, for a while I had it printed and kept next to my computer. You said, it's not boring. <laughs> you know, what is for, for me, for sure. But just to give all of you an idea of what those afternoons and mornings were like at Andy and Adriana's house, um, this is the poem that appears in my book, um, What Came Before, and it's for Andy. I want to be 85. I want to be 85, tucked between two hills, in a house that smells of morning, where a blind poodle sleeps on the chair next to the white chair where you like to sit. I want to be 85, with a jar of pencils worn to know, but words like monkeys swinging from vine to vine, then sliding down, down, into my mouth, my lips, the air, then finding a place in the white space on a piece of pink paper. I want to be 85 with a finch in a cage chirp chirping while the one I love is out dancing and Van Gogh sings of night from above the door and when you return, I say when you return, I'll bring in the black cat for the sake of the birds, pour you a cup of coffee, black with a dash of cream and two spoons of sugar. Mm. My great honor um, a couple of years ago I had a book that came out called The Sky Between Us and I invited some important people in my life to come share poems about sky and um, Andy brought a poem that he wrote called Climbing the Sky uh, and it's such a gift to me thank you Andy I treasure this Climbing the Sky leaving the Cotterets up to the south after the first traverse we left the takers of the waters like trader ants below. Ascending the causeway, dangling cups like aluminum chains, up the crystal skies, we passed the toffee folding machines, up through the bushy slopes, leaving behind the running waders and steaming chicory blenders retreating behind us and beneath. Up the thunder reverberating bowl of the Pic de Luce, the whole world behind was shrinking like a cupboard tucked in a fringe of grass then bent beneath and fell away. And we were in another world of long green slopes, world-weary yellow fields that fibrillated in the smoke of the August tingling air. Far away to the north, the blunt hills were reduced by space into rhythmic dimmy bubbles of France. The sun buzzed from the south, great too in its own right, and north and south the feral sisters tramped away one next to another like great ground bears of the Pyrenees. We walked the tightrope of a call, and there we were, arrived at last in the pockets of vastness, anchored to the earth only by air. Actually, Irene, who nominated Andy for the poet laureate position. Okay, Peter? Yep. First, I'm going to read another note. This mm -hmm. was from uh, Pablo Medina, a Cuban American poet and novelist who grew up in New York City. And he is currently a professor and director of the Masters of Fine Arts department at Emerson University. I met Andrew Glaze in Miami in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Andrew. I just moved there and was searching for good poets like a crazed Diogenes. Call me Andy, he said. I don't want to be associated with that horrible storm. <laughs> Andy was gentle and welcoming the complete antithesis of the hurricane. Whatever fury was in him came out in his poetry, which was then and is still determinedly engaged. I left Miami after two years, and eventually Andy did too, but I have remained a steadfast reader and student of his work. I have learned from him how to be true to the craft, despite the many disappointments a poet must endure. 
and how to stand with dignity, grace, and humor, always humor, before the storms that threaten to blow us away. Thank you, Andy, for your person, your friendship, and your extraordinary poetry. Pablo Medina. And I have the honor of reading the last poem for this, this party. This is called Shipwrecked Upon a Sea Coast in Bohemia, and it's subtitled Hooper and Don. He spoke orations like a stream full of bumping logs, sported legal erudition like a blackstone larynx, brave head wrapped like a turban in precedential fog. Called Hooper, he was a tall, luminous paragon of the law, whose humor hovered over a quiver full of jokes, like a lion advancing a congratulatory paw. He cheerfully scattered about himself, as though from the roof, vast pronouncements like three-winged eagles, absent-mindedly shopping down with a hyperextended spoof. Till the day came, he met Don, whose exciting battle of words had been played out of north in the home of the Broadway theater birds. Now she came flopping home like, a, like kingdom come to settle for what was at hand, with ample illusion left to strike a stone. Unfailingly, she was, as ever, theatrical, airy, playing life off the tips of disdainful fingers, squirt, squirt, distributing the goodies like a perspicacious fairy, dropping one over there, two over here, bloop, bloop. So be it. If you don't like it, dearie, send an email to my chicken soup. <laughs> she was constructed like the Bay Bridge, all distances and loops. In the clothes she made herself freehand, shaping the cloth in romantic visionary scissor swoops. Her full-length opera cloak included the hunt, the hunters, a dozen dogs, the deer, and, coming from behind, athwart the smoke, a trumpeter signaling their approach by honking the hours to his horse and welcoming them to an inn with an approaching coach. She'd happily turn and show you the panorama as she perceived it. Life was the fluttery, festive comedia of a swiftly revolving diorama. <laughs> Their meeting, it did come, was as though Blackbeard the pirate, Pistolero smoking, climbed aboard some gold-laden galleon with his shrieking parrot. Such explosions, they huffed, joked, laughed, circled, sang, challenged one, another, one the other like craziness each clanging the other as though the Liberty Bell had rung. Who was the audience? Who were the performers? At length, spent like blown-out Etnas and Krakatoas, they fell asleep in separate terra firmas. If Bonaparte had entered the room with Pitt the Younger, no doubt they'd have quickly learned the rule. One or both must depart. Two grand styles cancel each other out. I just wanted to add that I remember that dinner party. It really did happen. <laughs> um, Jenny, you wanted to come up and say something. I'm Jeannie Thompson from the Alabama Writers Forum, and I know many of you, and um, usually my job is to be the uh, politician for the arts in the room. Um, after hearing everybody read from your book, Andy, I don't want to be the politician in the room today. I don't want to have that job today. Today I want to go home and work on my writing. <laughs> and that's about the best thing uh, that can happen when somebody brings out a new book. But I do have to wear the cap for just a second and say that I want to congratulate uh, New South Books and Andy both for bringing out this book. I think it is a real landmark in Alabama poetry. And we did have the honor 
of inducting Andy into the newly created Alabama Writers Hall of Fame in June. And that was a lot of work <laughs> to put that on. And many people helped, including uh, Kathleen, who's here. And I had this giddy experience of standing on stage when it was over, well, when everything was over except the medal ceremony. And I started to ask you to wear your medal today, <laughs> so people could see it who weren't there. But um, as people, as the people came on stage who were the recipients and not the people standing in for the recipients, there was this cheering and standing up and ovation when Andy came on stage. And to be up there and see him and see the people and feel that was so exciting. And that's really why um, I continue to uh, be the politician for literary arts in Alabama, because those moments do happen and we're able to bring to the uh, bring to the fore the amazing talent that we have in Alabama. We really are blessed uh, not only to have many, um, many great things in many arenas, from football to rockets, uh, but we have amazing writers here. And I want everybody in the room who's a writer to know that and to own that, that Alabama's writers are as, are as fine as writers anywhere in this country. And Andy, thank you for uh, blessing us with uh, another book, and I hope everybody will visit uh, the bookstore when we're through. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate everybody who turned up coming and helping to celebrate and help launch this book. Go home and tell your friends about it, okay? <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs>